Hello everyone. I hope everybody's doing well, hanging in there. Uh, right now we're going to get into chapter 19 of the Tyndall and She book, or what was referred to as the political stalemate in the rural revolt of the Gilded Age. Um, this used to be a, a section of history that was skipped uh, for the interest of time. A lot of modern historians uh, just skipped this area because it was seen as so trivial. But We've learned that a lot of this political wrangling and political dialogue and terminology is really sets the stage for the 20th and now 21st century politics, and I'm going to demonstrate how there's connections in there. So it's kind of made its way back into the curriculum, if you will. And so uh, our focus today is on politics, and what you want to do is to continue this uh, understanding of the Gilded Age image, right, of the something that's very gilded, meaning it's covered on the surface with uh, gold leaf, but if you just scratch that thin surface, you'll you'll reach something that's ordinary, corruptible, and uh, not, you know, common. And so it happens again in, in politics. So the political changes of the, of the late 19th century really were triggered by urbanization of the United States and the industrialization. Obviously, they, they work in, in tandem. So the, the urban population grows significantly in the United States in the Gilded Age. So from a population of about 8 to 30 million people, and a great number of those are going to be immigrants, which we're going to deal with separately. But a lot of it was rural populations or surplus rural populations moving into the cities. A lot of the innovations in, in um, agriculture that we had talked about in a previous chapter uh, weaken the demand for agricultural workers. And those workers are now going to drift into urban areas looking for employment, which is a normal pattern that we see happening throughout history, just about anywhere. And so... Um, so cities were fertile soil for the party boss system, which I'm, I'm going to talk about in more detail uh, later on. But party bosses were able, these were non-politicians technically, but they were political operatives who essentially do favors for voters in exchange for voting in a particular way. And these party bosses are going to use these voting blocks to gain influence into the political system. And I'll explain how this became very corrupting. Um, and agricultural labor, I just, as I said before, right, is moving uh, to the cities because of the drop in, in workforce. So in order to have urban growth, right, one of the first things that has to happen is innovation in uh, the way um, housing is done. And uh, to have multiple people in a building, which are basically going to be referred to as four-story walk-ups, right, is the um, invention of the steam radiator in the 1870s. This is going to allow for heating of large multi-unit spaces and um, it's uh, something that you don't see too awful much. It, obviously, in contemporary homes, particularly out here in California, you don't see too many steam radiators. Uh, but they do still operate in some larger, uh, older cities if you, if you get a chance to look into them. The other is the electric elevator. Now, um, th this is where we get kind of a misnomer, right? Uh, Otis did not invent the elevator. He invented the elevator braking system. And so um, I, I spoke about this, I believe, in uh, Chapter 17. But this is a major innovation. And without it, you can't have large buildings, particularly skyscrapers. And Elijah Otis um, invented a way for a gripping system to spring out and grab the shaft of the elevator if the cable of the elevator broke. And this obviously increases safety for, you know, millions of people, right? But more importantly, it allows for buildings to go above four stories, which obviously is going to have a huge impact because we have the advent of what we could today call skyscrapers. Now, New York had skyscrapers essentially first, but uh, in 1870, there's what's referred to as the Great Chicago Fire. And um, in this the entire downtown of Chicago, which was almost entirely uh, built of wood, burns to the ground. Now, 
the leaders of Chicago get together and decide that they are going to rebuild, but they're going to rebuild with um, a set of laws, what we today call zoning laws or building codes that are going to restrict how the buildings are made. And they make a decision that the downtown buildings are going to be made according to specific rules and focus on concrete and steel, non-flammable uh, spaces, as, as it were. Now, the guy who's considered the father of the skyscraper, so to speak, is, a, is an architect referred to as Louis Sullivan. And uh, you can see a variety of his buildings uh, in, in mostly... Um, in mostly eastern cities, there's, I think, one or two Louis Sullivan buildings in San Francisco and then one perhaps still in in, in Los Angeles. Uh, there was one in San Diego that was inadvertently torn down before they realized that they had, in fact, a Louis Sullivan building, which is somewhat of a tragedy. But uh, he came up with a line that form must follow function. And so you get these uh, very straight... Uh, linear concrete buildings but you see the decorative designs around the cornices and um, window treatments that are very beautifully ornate in either um, wrought iron or as the case is in, in the west coast there's a lot of terracotta uh, flourishes done in them and they follow something from the French. It's called the Beaux-Arts movement, which was for the late uh, 19th century. And Sullivan was influenced by that and, and incorporated in there. If you're ever in Chicago, uh, which is a great city to visit, uh, they have in the summertime a museum loop. So the L train, which is the subway of, of Chicago, is actually above ground. And, it, and there's a loop is around the downtown. In the summer, there's a, a museum train you could pay extra, and it goes just around the loop. And they stop at all of the major buildings, and they do. It's like an architect's uh, museum tour. It's really fascinating to do. There's also one in the water. You could take a boat tour around the city, and they'll point out some of the major buildings, which is it's really kind of fun to do if you have the chance. But um, Louis Sullivan is is perhaps best known as the mentor. For the architect Frank Lloyd Wright, who has a very major influence in, in uh, residential and, and building design, designer of the Guggenheim Museum, for instance. So subways and trolleys also become very important here. Moving urban peoples from spot A to spot B. Um, subways is uh, basically an innovation in, in New York. It happens in London around the same time. Uh, these were major projects, by the way. To, to put in the subway system of New York required actually digging the entire street up. It, it, the entire thing was opened up for hundreds of feet. And first a sewer and water system were put through. And then uh, the tunnels for the uh, trains. So it was a very elaborate system which required a lot of construction, which were very lucrative projects to get if you were in the construction business. And I'm going to go over why that's relevant a little later. So cities were mostly ba ba built without codes and planned systems. So tenement buildings, which were really um, kind of like death traps in some cities, uh, what actually initially had shared toilets and in some cases outhouses. Uh, live barn animals, farm animals, were actually in the streets of places like New York and Chicago and Philadelphia and Boston. Uh, people would throw their food waste out into the street and then these animals would just literally eat them. And that way people could have eggs and pork and, and, and things like this. It's really kind of um, gross if you really think about it too much. But... Um, uh, now, these tenement buildings were just incredibly unsafe, and the diets of, of urban populations decreases pretty quickly. And so we have a very high rate of infant mortality in the cities. And, you know, I have students sometimes who tell me they look at these pictures of the city and they'll see a family with like eight kids. And I'm like, well, th that's because so many of them died. You know, these just 
you know, these are the ones that actually survived. It's it's really very tragic story. Um, so the raw sewage and the street animals, you know, uh, basically eating the garbage. It's um, it it created an environment where we have not just outbreaks of diseases. We have epidemics that will break out in in cholera, uh, diphtheria, typhoid. Uh, tuberculosis was a major killer. Um, both my great great grandfather, excuse me, my great grandfather and my great grandmother uh, both died of tuberculosis in um, New York City. And so it's it's a, a, a really uh, unhealthy environment, particularly for the working classes that were out there. In terms of the immigration, I've kind of touched on this before. But by 1900, there are about 9 million immigrants coming every year. Now, initially, in, starting in the colonial period, um, immigration was very unsupervised. You got a ticket on a ship. You came uh, to the United States with a ship. They dropped you off on the pier wherever they happened to land, and you just figured it out. And if you could prove that you lived here for five years, you went through an naturalization process. It was really quite unmanaged. Um, the, the, the system became so overwhelming that everybody started to demand for some sort of a regulation. So Ellis Island, it gets started for really processing purposes. People, People like to think that, oh, no, Ellis Island was there in order to restrict who gets into the country. And that's that's really not what the focus was. The factories of America demanded more workforce. So uh, Ellis Island was really for processing people, not excluding them. People did get excluded, right? If you had a communicable disease or demonstrated some sort of a psychological disorder or had any kind of criminal background that they could find, you were sent back. I mean, there, there's no question about it. But those numbers were actually rather small. This was about processing people and what to do. So the new immigrants, as they called it, in this great wave of immigration were coming primarily from Southern and Eastern Europe and also from China mostly on the West Coast, obviously. So um, this created different challenges because this is a very large influx of Catholics, of Jews, of Eastern Orthodox religions, the Greek Orthodox, Armenians, and obviously for the Chinese, people who were not Christian at all, right? Or even of a Western religion. Uh, and and this is going to trigger a, a kind of new wave of, of nativism that kind of sparks in, in America. Whenever we have great waves of immigration, there's a new wave of, of nativism. And so what was different about Ellis Island, and again, if this is also a, another great uh, side trip. If you're ever in New York City, um, it's a great thing to go. There's a boat tour now that will go to the Statue of Liberty and then take you to Ellis Island where there's a major um, museum there. And you can see it. It's fantastic um, a side trip, as I said, if you get a chance to do it. And basically, not only were there immigration officers there to regulate the process, but work agents were sent to actually offer contracts and they would actually give train tickets to families to go into the interior to places like Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Buffalo and Chicago and Dayton and all these other places where there were these factories popping up that needed more workers. And there were also train and steamboat ticket agents there in order to get people on their way and to get them out of the cities because the cities were becoming so incredibly overcrowded as early as the 18, late 1880s. And so um, uh, the process was, was rather complicated, you know. And so um, one of the problems with the massive immigration were the creation of what we refer to as ethnic enclaves. So 
for us in San Diego, we still have Little Italy and a Chinatown, which are really not there anymore, it, just a name. But um, at this time, in pretty much every urban area of America, there were these ethnic enclaves. And so first generation immigrants who found themselves in a new country, a new language, a new culture, got a great deal of comfort of living among people of their own ethnic background. And so these little Italys and Chinatowns uh, emerged. There was Moscow on the Hudson in um, Manhattan. There was um, Hebrewville, which was basically the Lower East Side. There was Little Tokyo, uh, right? So these places begin to emerge. They'll have newspapers in their native language. They'll have uh, social clubs that will be focused on um, maintaining uh, cultural connections that they had. And uh, these became rather significant things. And one of the reasons why these enclaves shrank over time is because the second generation American members of these families were half in the old culture and half in the new. But by the second generation, right, the second generation Americans, they were predominantly Americanized, as it were, and were leaving the enclave because they felt more comfortable in, uh, you know, areas where it was more of, of an American system, if you will. And so places like Little Italy, uh, you go in a lot of cities today and those areas are incredibly small, if existing, period. And, and that's because of this, um, what I'm going to call assimilation narrative that kind of is common among all ethnic groups that come into the United States. So this research in nativism really comes in a number of ways, and they're all talked about in the book. So basically, the Dillingham Commission was set up to basically find different ways to, you know, rationalize excluding people. <laughs> it was it was not uh, really a fact finding mission as much as a complaining session. And in 1882, we actually get the Chinese Exclusion Act. And as I said before, this is a unique thing. People tend to think of all the ethnic groups that we kind of kind of don't like or whatever. But to this date. Uh, Chinese are are the only nationality barred from immigrating by law. And it's renewed twice. And full-scale Chinese immigration is not permitted in the United States until 1943. And that's essentially because China's fighting on our side during World War II. And uh, that's really pretty significant, right, that this, this happens. There are two interest groups that emerge in the Gilded Age, targeted towards restricting immigration. One is the American Protection Association and the other is the Immigration Restriction League. These two groups will become very active and eventually succeed by 1920, which we'll talk about when we get there, about excluding certain groups from immigration, something which is referred to as the quota system. And we'll get into that more detail later. As far as American culture, right? Vaudeville becomes one of the main theater uh, productions for the period. It, it's very, very popular. And there's a heavy Jewish influence in vaudeville. Great documentary by PBS called uh, Jewish Humor in America. And uh, uh, what's referred to as the shtick uh, comes from a large number of Yiddish Jewish immigrants who come to the United States and uh, become active in show business. And uh, vaudeville is kind of the precursor to um, the reviews and, and vaudeville, or excuse me, uh, Broadway musicals somewhat. Um, but if you ever watch Jimmy Fallon, you're going to see a present day manifestation of vaudeville. You had an MC who usually made jokes about current events, and then you had various talent that would come up and do and demonstrate that talent. Right? There would be singers, there would be tap dancers, there would be uh, family routines, there would be um, skits done. Some people would be Shakespearean actors that would go around the country doing scenes from popular uh, 
Shakespearean plays. There were animal acts. There were acrobats. There, you know, just all kinds of different things. And these these uh, these shows would tour uh, around the around the United States and incredibly popular programs. Um, and so uh, now lyceums were uh, theaters built. Uh, San Diego, for instance, has a Lyceum Theater, and pretty much every major city that's old enough would have a Lyceum. Lyceum, the Lyceum system was basically lecture circuits. This was mostly for um, famous authors of the time. Mark Twain uh, made an, a lot of money touring the United States, giving talks, lectures on just American life and American uh, literature, and. Uh, um, Winston Churchill becomes very famous in the United States. In fact, what makes him famous in the United States and well known is that he was a uh, Lyceum uh, uh, tour that went around the in the United States and uh, made himself a, a good amount of money. And it was a very popular pastime for people to go and listen to lectures. Uh, and, and to listen to new things from authors. It was also a big because of photography. People would go on tours of Africa and what was called the Grand Tour, which was London, Paris, Rome. And, and you know, and they would do these photo uh, journals and then they would uh, tour the United States and basically show their slideshow on their trip and talk about all the different things that were going on. And, and people found these to be very, very uplifting and edifying. And it was a, it was a big movement of the time period. And, um, you know, people would make an evening of it. I, I, I actually just did one in San Diego. The author, uh, David Sedaris was, is touring the country and I went to, to see him give his talk and it was a full regular theater. It was, uh, it was actually very enjoyable. Scientific breakthroughs of the period mostly had to do with uh, a new breakthrough in what was referred to as germ theory. This is something that got introduced during the Crimean War and then later um, uh, the Civil War. These were not Americans, uh, basically. Um, Pasteur and Lister, where we get the term Listerine, right, uh, postulated that it was germs that caused disease, not what was referred to as bad air or the miasma theory. And that was a very big, big thing. The other was an innovation that was experimented with during the Civil War, which is the use of uh, um, uh, ether for um, anesthesia, right, to, to knock a patient out, uh, which was considered a big, big thing. So uh, these two things were pretty big. There was also a lot of goofy stuff going on. Uh, phrenology, for instance, which is the ability to judge somebody's competence by examining their skull. Uh, this is going to be something that's picked up by the Nazis, for instance, to be able to determine whether somebody's Aryan or not. Just some really ridiculous stuff. In the United States, um, health diets became a fad. Uh, Kellogg, right, the man who invented cornflakes, did it because he thought people needed a non-meat uh, version of breakfast. And, and, and came up with cornflakes. Um, Sylvester Graham comes up with his graham cracker as a vegetarian alternative for food, right? And uh, uh, C.W. Post also did this. And, and there were these health spas uh, in the Victorian period in Europe and in the Gilded Age here in the United States. Big, beautiful places where you went to take quote-unquote cures for different health issues. In San Diego, for instance, we have the Hotel Del Coronado, which was basically an oceanside uh, health resort for the very wealthy to go to. Um, now, with the advent of industrialization and urban areas came what I refer to as the standardization of leisure time. So leisure was something really reserved for the well-off, which prompted people to call it the leisure class, as it were. Now, it's, it's hard for us to imagine this, but for workers in American factories, they were working five or six 10-hour workdays, which is very hard for us to imagine that, right? A 60-hour work week. But 
in the early period of industrialization and urbanization, most of these people either immigrating or migrating into the cities were farmers, former farmers. And for them, work was 24 hours a day. You were always on the job because of the um, growing seasons, but also animal husbandry, right? Chickens, cows, pigs, horses, right? They don't stop operating at five o'clock, right? They're 24 hours, they're five days a week, or excuse me, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, right? There is no time off, as it were. So um, for many, this was now you started work at seven, you ended work at five, and you had Sunday off. And this allowed for people to take up hobbies and leisure. And so the Gilded Age really becomes the advent of professional sports. Baseball is an obsession in the United States and why it becomes called America's pastime. Boxing is also a very big deal. Um, but horse racing has been popular in the United States from a very early times in the colonial period, but now it's becoming more accessible to people from the, uh, from, uh, the working classes and the middle classes. The other is the advent of what's referred to as the mechanical bicycle. So this is the gears and chain system that we all recognize in, a, in our bicycles, but back then it was a new creation. And so cycling becomes a very big fad, especially among women. Uh, women found it very enjoyable to get on a bike, you could get away and kind of be on your own thing. But it, it became very, very popular sport. Uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright, the Wright brothers, were bicycle makers uh, before inventing the um, airplane. So photographs and motion pictures, these were two innovations by Edison, talked about those earlier. Um, but this is a very big deal. Uh, the earliest motion picture, picture shows were, sh were done in um, uh, storefronts along boardwalks and streets. They were called Nickelodeons because these were little um, cine cinegraphs uh, that was basically just one scene, a cinemascope that rotated and you could basically see one scene of action. And you, at first it was cranking the handle, but then there was electrical ones that you just put a nickel in the machine and it would just automatically do this. And, and th it quickly becomes a big deal. By the end of the Gilded Age, we have a motion picture, a full feature, if you will, motion picture of about, just about uh, one hour. Saloons have always been a big deal. Uh, in the colonial period, referred to mostly as taverns. But saloons were gathering places, particularly for the working classes. And um, uh, again, very big places to operate. Um, now, amusement parks also get their advent in the Gilded Age. So Coney Island, um, Belmont Park here in San Diego, Asbury Park in New Jersey, right? These uh, Atlantic City, for instance. I mean, these were all big amusement areas along... Uh, resorts in the United States, and they become an incredibly popular thing for people to do. And so, um, now fraternal orders were uh, basically social clubs, and for whatever reason, I'm not particularly sure why they're they're almost all named after animals. So there's the Lions Club, the Moose Lodge, the Elks Airy, the um, uh, you know, all these different groups. And it was essentially a place for guys to kind of get away from home and, and just hang out and drink and play cards and do all this other stuff. H however, they also engaged in civic tasks. Uh, these groups still exist. And, uh, and, and their f focus is to try to make positive contributions to their neighborhoods and communities. And once they kind of got established, uh, women got involved as well, and they were called lady auxiliaries. So you could, the husband joins the Elks, and the wife is, becomes the lady Elks auxiliary. And um, again, social organizations that were meant to kind of reach out and help uh, make the community a better place. 
something that's somewhat odd for us today is something referred to as a promenade or the promenade. These are basically very wide, I mean, street size wide um, sidewalks. And people would have their dinners in the evening and then it was popular for the family to go out and go for a walk. And these promenades became really popular. It was kind of like the C and B scene. It's, you know, you know, like young kids like to go to malls, you know, so they can all hang out and see who's out there. Well, back then it was the promenade or the promenade. And it became uh, a rather uh, popular f pastime for families. Dance halls were um, really introduced through the amusement parks. Almost every amusement park had a dance hall in the middle of it. And um, this was kind of a big deal. In, in the rural agricultural traditional societies, young boys and young girls did not mingle with each other, particularly in public, without a chaperone. It, it was just a very standard norm Urban areas changed this, and the amusement park and the dance halls become places where young men and women, single men and women, could sort of get away from the family and meet members of the opposite sex. Uh, the dance hall craze of the time is something referred to as ragtime music, and if you've ever engaged in it before ragtime is is a, is a precursor to modern jazz and scott joplin is considered the master of this genre and he was an african-american musician who made his money as it's a it was a sizable fortune i would judge for the time but he did it by selling sheet music and um Piano rolls. These were uh, things that you could put into a, a spinet piano, and it, it uh, spun and it, it it worked these gears that would actually play the piano without anybody having to play it. Uh, you know, I don't know other any other way to explain it. And he made his money that way. He was not very successful in performing, however, because he was African American. He was excluded from performing in a, in most areas of the country. And um, which is a tragedy of, of American arts. Uh, his masterpiece was something called the Maple Leaf Rag, but most Americans would recognize uh, the Entertainer, which you know basically is you know da 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 right. Most Americans can recognize that song, but that was the Entertainer, and it's by Scott Joplin. And uh, people enjoyed dancing to that. This is the two-step uh, and the quick step, which were two dance biggies for young people at the time. So we wanted to have a conversation now about Charles Darwin. Now, his original first edition was published in 1859, The Origin of Species. And I I'm not going to get into his discussion about evolution, but the social impact of the idea of a challenge to the notion of man's existence. America, for the most part, since the second great awakening of the 1800s, early 1800s, had been dominated by an evangelical Protestant uh, sentiment. And included in this dogma was the notion of the earth or the universe being created in six 24 hours days and and that God in fact rested on the seventh the Sabbath and this was a predominantly held notion but Darwin's book challenges this right evolution now starts to explain how man comes from a different source not not what it was right and this this was very disrupting to the American uh, cultural center which I refer to as evangelical Protestantism. You could also refer to it as white Anglo-Saxon Protestant WASP mm -hmm. culture that was out there. So a British uh, sociologist named Herbert Spencer coined the term social Darwinism to suggest that civilizations evolved just like humans did 
And this is where we got the notion of survival of the fittest. Now, this theory is going to be utilized to promote colonialism, to promote Nazism, to promote uh, racial segregation in the South. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's going to be used to justify nativism against immigrants. In the United States, it gets popularized. And the man who's kind of credited for that is uh, a Yale professor, right? Uh, William Graham Sumner. Uh, his book Folkways in 1907 supported this theory that certain groups, and it's interesting because it gets linked into a new science, quote unquote, that gets developed in this period, uh, anthropology or the study of man. And this was mostly of British um, university creation. And, and that's because uh, the British government wanted to understand the peoples that they had conquered. And this becomes really dangerous because we get from this the what's referred to as orientalizing or um, describing of the other. So, uh, uh, you know, the person no longer looks at a different person as being sovereign of themselves with a certain purpose and definition and... Um, identity, but rather is somebody that needs to be explained, the other, right? And so we get dialogues of things like, oh, one must never communicate directly with a person of this culture because they are this, 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 right? And that's uh, very off-putting um, things. And of course, anthropology is going to go through huge uh, reforms in the 20th century because of the negative impact of a lot of this, right? Well, Lester Frank Ward's Dynamic Sociology, which was published in 1883, challenged Herbert Spencer on this. And he introduced something referred to as Reform Darwinism. And it didn't dispute that there was this evolutionary difference between civilizations, but rather that the human brain can develop and, and can improve, and that societies can improve. So the evolutionary reality was not stagnant, but fluid. And this is going to promote something later referred to as progressive education. The idea that you can take individuals and move them up sort of the evolutionary scale by offering them uh, education. So uh, the impact in arts and literature, right? The, the Civil War gets really basically killed, uh, kills the romantic spirit, right? The romantic movement of the early 20th or 19th century is really destroyed by by um, romanticism, and it's gonna uh, and it's also the new art of photography. So daguerreotypes have existed for quite a while at this point, but modern photography gets its birth around the time of the Civil War, and this becomes a craze. People are fascinated by it, and so um, this feeds into a new movement referred to as realism which is seeing the world as it is rather than how you would like it to be, which was a very romantic or emotional uh, perception of the world. And so realism is going to come to uh, dominate art and literature. So in literary realism, your book goes through um, various authors of the time period, right? And these were uh, pretty famous people. And again, the, the, the dialogue is more stark. It is... Um, it's not necessarily meant to evoke um, deep emotional responses, but to basically deal with the, the good, bad, and the ugly of life and, and to not sort of uh, screen over it. And so another one of the authors, Stephen Crane, who writes the book Red Badge of Courage, has a rather graphic description of life as a soldier uh, in the Civil War. If you've read some of these uh, authors before, uh, Henry James becomes very famous, a book called Daisy Miller, and this becomes a big theme, which is uh, Americans as these naive, uh, unworldly people who go to Europe and, and, and become incorporated into life there where it's more sophisticated and nuanced and urbane and they kind of get lost in this reality. 
uh, Theodore Dreiser comes up with some very stark books such as uh, um, Sister Carrie, uh, which were sort of like these people, you know, young people go to the big city, try to make it big, and they're just dragged down and destroyed. And, you know, uh, and Sister Carrie, she becomes a prostitute and she just, you know, horrible things that happen, right? Uh, because life is just, you know, what it is. It's hard. Life is tough and, and, and tragic. In, in art, the realists are significantly impacted by photography and the, the obsession with capturing movement becomes a very big deal, but also trying to make um, uh, one's subject look real. So George Bellows, for instance, abandons the romantic, right? Because the romantic art focused a lot on the on the um, country landscape and the seascapes. Bellows is almost exclusively urban landscapes, crowded cities, and boxing matches where you know you kind of lose sight of the action because the people are so crowded in. Um, Thomas Aikens is probably the quintessential realist. He has um, almost a criminal level obsession with a surgeon at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Uh, Aikens was a professor in the uh, art department. Um, and he took photographs of all of his subjects before he painted them. And he did a series of paintings on uh, Dr. Gross, believe it or not. Could you imagine a doctor named Gross? But anyhow, um, he did a series of paintings and Gross, Gross became, just did, became sick of him. He's just, get him away from me. But anyway, um, uh, Aikens loses his job at the art school at the University of Pennsylvania because he uh, removed the loincloth from a male nude model and there were females in the class and this big scandal and um he he never really recovers from it he's he's it's it's a rather big scandal of the time period uh, james whistler who's probably known to a lot of americans from a, a painting that's some people consider his masterpiece which is uh themes in gray and white which is uh often referred to as whistler's mother uh also has kind of an obsession in this area. Whistler, however, really does most of his work in Europe. He's he's an American artist, but he basically becomes an expatriate, similar to Henry James, who spends most of his time, as does Edith Wharton, if I remember correctly, in Europe. Now, Gilded Age politics is very much within the Gilded theme. Um, the party boss system was focused mostly in the local and state level cities. And these new and growing cities became very big centers of uh, life for the party boss. And basically what they did is they utilized these growing populations, particularly the immigrant populations that were unfamiliar with American political systems but were eager to participate in the voting, uh, kind of get drawn in. Um, the example that they talk about in the textbook is the quintessential or the epitome of uh, Gilded Age bosses, and that's uh, Boss Tweed, a Democratic boss in the city of New York. He operated out of a building called Tammany Hall, and to this day, when people feel that there's backroom wheeling and dealing going on and shifty and corrupted politics, we'll refer to it as Tammany Hall politics. And so uh, Boss Tweed began going into poor and, er and immigrant neighborhoods and helping to clean up garbage, take care of um, uh, people who needed jobs, uh, beautifying certain areas, fixing gas lamps, these sorts of things. And at every time he did it, he would hand out his, his business card. On election day, he would literally bring the bandwagon into these neighborhoods and gather people and lead them to the polls. And he would have a ballot conveniently filled out already, right? A, what we call a party ballot. And people would simply take the ballot and go in and put it in the ballot box. 
one of the sort of tongue in cheek uh, slogans of the time for the Democratic Party was to ver- er, vote early and often. And, you know, this this becomes a rather corruptive reality of the system. But what happened then is these bosses could demonstrate large voting blocks. So when candidates wanted to ensure that they would be successful, they would go to the party bosses and get their approval. And then the party bosses would produce these voting blocks. And so um, what then happened then, in a, a great example, Tweed would help get somebody elected mayor of New York. And as I stated earlier, there were all these building projects going on mostly for uh, the subways being put into New York, but also the development of police departments and firemen and, and sanitation departments. These were all new and these feed into the party boss system um, because once his candidate became mayor, then he had free access to his office and he would go in and say, oh, I see you're going to use this. Uh, I see you're going to build this um, tr- you know, train station. Oh, here's a card of the construction company that I want you to use. And sure enough, they get hired to do the job and then they would slip a good chunk of cash into Boss Tweed's pocket. He would then use that uh, to pay for the patronage system that gets installed where people were given favors, usually jobs, in, in exchange for their vote. And in uh, the, the Northeast in particular, this was very powerful for uh, Irish immigrants. Um, uh, starting with Boss Tweed, uh, the, the, you know, the bosses would give their cards and send Irish people down to the new, newly forming police departments and fire departments for Italians, it was the sanitation department. And these all, all this patronage has huge cultural impacts in the United States. I, I challenge you, go watch old movies. Uh, and anytime there's a policeman, he's Irish. He's either Officer Sullivan or Officer O'Leary or, or something like that. And same with firemen. And in fact, the one of the world's largest Pat, St. Patrick's Day parades is New York City. And it's sponsored by the New York Fire and Police Departments. And every precinct has a bagpipe and drum band. And and I'm not kidding you at all. Go go to New York City for for St. Patrick's Day and you're going to see kilts everywhere. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And it's this impact of massive amounts of Irish immigrants, part of the patronage system voting Democrat because they were guaranteed these these jobs in the in in the government. So um, the party rings became a circle of these cronies who worked for and with the party bosses. So um, uh, party bosses would divide the city up into wards and precincts and they would hire people to go around doing favors and getting voters together and all this other stuff. It became a very complicated, what we refer to as a party machine. So it was a complete operation of party rings and patronage, and it all operated almost on its own. It was a self-perpetuating system that took the spoil system that that, um, Jackson innovated in the 1830s and just put it on steroids. And it became a very corrupted system. Um, Boss Tweed himself is going to be arrested for graft and corruption, amounting to about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in city contracts that he that he um, grafted into. And um, it, it's actually a funny story because he gets arrested and they put him in jail. And surprise, shock, and alarm, he escapes. And you know the. The cops that he helped get jobs were supposed to watch him in prison. I mean, it was silly, but he flees and tries to go to Spain, but a customs official recognizes him from a Thomas Nast cartoon who was kind of seen as America's first professional uh, political cartoonist. And, and Nast's cartoons were scathing against Boss Tweed. Just he haunted Tweed. Tweed, Tweed tried to have him killed. And it's um, just this amazing story about how a political cartoonist could get somebody arrested and put into jail. Um, Thomas Nast, by the way, 
is credited for giving us our present-day vision uh, version of Santa Claus, the, the German version. Nast is a German immigrant. And he also gives us the Republican elephant and the Democrat donkey. Um, and, uh, you know, he's kind of remembered as this great uh, animation artist. So national politics... The gilded part of it, of course, is we had 70 to 80 percent participation rate. If now today, if we get 54 percent, uh, you know, voter participation, we think we've had a, a fairly decent election cycle. This is 70 to 80 percent. But what we have to remember is that number is deceptive because some people were voting two or three times in an election cycle. Other also, people were being literally bribed with jobs and 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 booze and money and food in order to vote. So both the Democrats and the Republican parties, right? They're both in what I'm referring to as an identity crisis in the Gilded Age. They both came to a point where they had to reinvent themselves to some degree. Um, the Democrats were perceived as the party of secession. All the people who seceded from the union were Democrats. And this becomes a problem for the party. They are able to bring themselves back together, but now they had to fight this image. And so they start to become the party of the urban environment. They're going to appeal to immigrant groups. They're going to uh, um, move towards the working classes of the city. But they still retained this Southern Democratic faction, right, which we'll later refer to as the Blue Dogs. Uh, and uh, this creates problems for the Democrats. For the Republicans, it was a different thing. They were a victim of their own success. Uh, the Republican Party formed primarily for two reasons, end slavery and keep the union together. And both of those have been accomplished. So for Republicans, it's kind of a, what do we do now? What do we stand for today? And Republicans who are going to be kind of the party of the of the farmer, uh, but you're going to see them move towards the corporate ownership. They're also going to become the party of nativism, which is still prevalent in the Republican Party. Sort of the anti-immigrant, you know, sort of the Donald Trump build the wall, right? Is it, it resonates with Republicans still because there's always been a nativist element in the Republican Party. Now. Besides the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, base, as it, as it were, we see the African-American support. And this also sounds odd to contemporary ears. But the, but the African-American vote, if they were able to vote, right? Southern blacks were being disenfranchised in, in huge numbers in some places entirely. But um, where blacks could vote, they were almost unanimously Republican because the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln and the party of Grant. And for a lot of African Americans, that's all they needed to know. And they voted Republican. And this would continue until really the 1930s. So another element of national politics is a ta tactic referred to as waving the bloody shirt. In the, in the Reconstruction period, there was a debate about whether to stop funding Reconstruction. And a congressman from Ohio had received a uh, shirt from one of his constituents who had been wounded in battle in the Civil War. And he made a speech to the Congress telling his colleagues that they needed to support this in order to honor the sacrifice of the veterans. And he waved his constituents' shirt, uh, you know, hence waving the bloody shirt. And so today in American politics, whenever we have a candidate essentially promoting himself as a candidate because he's a veteran or because he's a, a wounded veteran or a hero of war, it's referred to as waving the bloody shirt. So we also see temperance reemerge. Alcoholism uh, can, becomes a problem again in the late half of the 19th century. And so organizations begin to form to um, combat this. The Women's Christian Temperance Union is still active, but there's also the Anti-Saloon League, Carry Nation. And they'll actually literally go into bars and just smash up the place, right? And um, 
prohibition is now a little bit different from temperance. Temperance had varying degrees of prohibition. People now start to promote uh, what they call dry laws. So states like Kansas and Maine will become dry states that just will not allow alcohol in the state. And this is going to become a big push, which ultimately culminates into the 18th Amendment. But that's quite a ways down the road. Um, Another interest group that forms that's really quite powerful is a veterans group called the Grand Army of the Republic, or GAR. And they're going to push for a lot of benefits from the Republican Party, which is the main party there. They formed, actually, because they wanted to uh, support Grant when he was facing so many corruption charges during his administration. Uh, But they also wanted to promote benefits for for, um, Union soldiers and, and their families. So at the national level, the, Dem- the Republican Party dominates, right? From 1860 until 1932, only two Democrats will be elected president. All the rest of them are Republican, which is pretty big domination. The other thing that's uh, prevalent is that no president at the time clearly won a majority of the popular vote, meaning nobody got 50% or more of the popular vote. Which leads us to another list of what we'll call forgotten presidents, right? Most of them serve only one term, and they're uh, really not very uh, powerful. In fact, almost all of them are products of the party machinery. So they weren't voted into office because they had a large following of voters. They, they They were voted into office because the party bosses and the party machine supported them and put them in those positions. And so we get very weak presidents at the time. So when we look at the the, um, states of the union, 16 tended to vote Republican, 14 tended to vote Democrat, and there were six what we would call swing states that could go in either direction. And, you know, this this, um, meant that a lot of tight elections were fought in those six states and the others were just sort of locked in because of so much party loyalty at the time. So the two largest electoral states in the Gilded Age are New York and Ohio, and it stays that way for quite a long time. In fact, Ohio uh, becomes so dominant in the Electoral College that the saying uh, gets established that as Ohio goes, so goes the nation. Uh, And that's because Ohio has always, even up till now, Ohio has always voted for the winner in the election. And and so it's a very dominant uh, state. So with this is the idea that um, Congress should be more important and more powerful than the president. So this is before State of the Union addresses. This is before executive orders were being handed out like candy. This is a time when presidents were seen as men who are supposed to execute the laws passed by the Congress. It's a very different notion for us to kind of think of today when we think of um, national politics. So in the presidential campaigns of the time, uh, we have quite a bit of um, uh, activity that's going on that sort of demonstrates the sort of gilded imagery of the period, right? The idea that everything looks great on the surface, but beneath it, it's really pretty corrupted and and gross. So what we get first in the presidential elections is this sort of system that was um, being perpetuated called the spoil system. We just talked about this, right? The patronage, the party machinery. Because Republicans dominated the national scene, Their spoil system dominated the bureaucracy. So there was a great deal of corruption and it started to look bad on the Republican Party. So during Grant's administration, there were so many bureaucracy-related scandals that people began to believe that either the presidents were running these scandals or 
this the machinery was so sophisticated and operating so independent of the president that the president had no power to control it. So the Republicans started to debate among themselves what to do about that. Stalwarts believed that the spoil system was doing great, that the patronage and everything was perfectly fine, and they didn't need to leave it alone. Half-breeds were Republicans who were reform-minded. They said, you know, we got to clean it up. Now, half-breed is a racial slur. It's, it's a term that means somebody who's half European and half American Indian. And the implication of it is that it's a person that has no real home. They, they don't belong in white society and they don't belong in Indian society. And so they're kind of unwelcomed, right? So this is, this is the narrative that kind of plays out. Well, in, in 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes uh, is a reformer who tries to, uh, you know, clean up the system. And after two terms of Grant, there were a lot of people in the Republican Party who were ready to clean things up. And unfortunately for Hayes, his administration is is seen as corrupt from the very beginning. Now, this is a, a famous, we talked about this uh, at the end, uh, if you were with me in, this, in the fall, uh, we talk about this. Um, the election of 1876 was very scandal-ridden, um, and Rutherford B. Hayes was an incredibly straight-laced guy. He and his wife were teetotalers. They were completely dry, no alcohol whatsoever. Um, the family's favorite pastime was to sit in the parlor after dinner and sing church hymns, right? I call him the Ned Flanders of the Gilded Age. Um, some people um, jokingly called him Rutherford Behaves, right? I mean, that's how straight-laced this guy was. Well, in the election, his opponent, Samuel Tilden, actually had more popular votes, but Two southern states, Louisiana and Florida, and to a lesser extent, South Carolina actually, couldn't determine whose electors would be uh, certified to go to the Electoral College. Now, I know what you're thinking. Florida, really? Yes, Florida, again, can't figure out how to do its votes, right? So anyway, um, if, if they did a recount with Republicans... You know, Hayes won. If if it was a recount by Democrats, Tilden won, right? So they couldn't certify a winner. Now, in the Constitution, it's somewhat clear here. Whenever the Electoral College fails to choose a winner, the House of Representatives is supposed to vote for the for the president. There's some debate as whether the Senate votes for the the vice president, right? Because the vice president is the president of the Senate. Regardless, well, it's so close to the Civil War that members of the House and Senate were terrified that if they injected themselves into it with straight votes, that it was going to stir up a, a great deal of hostility and violence. And in fact, militias form in some states over who should be the winner. And so they appointed a commission because that's what Congress does, right? They they don't decide anything. They form a commission to investigate. And the Electoral Commission had 15 members. Well, seven of them were Republicans, seven of them were Democrats, and one was a member of the Supreme Court and was supposedly a nonpartisan uh, appointee of Abraham Lincoln. And so um, everybody thought, oh, this would be fine, and they did this investigation. Well, in a vote of eight to seven, Right, seven Republicans plus the member of the of uh, the Supreme Court. By vote of eight to seven, they decided that Hayes would be given the presidency. In other words, the electors from those states would be given to Hayes. But Hayes promised to withdraw the last Union troops from the South, therefore ending Reconstruction, sometimes referred to as the Compromise of eighteen seventy seven. It's also the reason why our course starts in 1877, because this is supposedly the, the turning point of the era. 
And from then on, uh, the president is referred to as Rutherford or his fraudulency. Some people called him old eight to seven. And basically, he was a lame duck president from day one. I mean, he just really never was able to establish any uh, political stronghold whatsoever. And he's a one-term president. Well, that issue then lingered. And so we get to the election of 1880, and James Garfield from Ohio, right, um, a Civil War veteran, um, and he was a product of the spoil system as well, the patronage. He was sponsored by James G. Blaine, who was a party boss from the state of Maine. A little rhyme there. And um, uh, the, the Republicans resisted Garfield because he was a half-breed. And a number of uh, stalwarts uh, didn't want to give their support. The leading of the the leaders of this group was a the party boss for Republicans in New York City, Stephen Conkling, who will become senator from New York. Um, Conkling wanted his underling, Chester Arthur, to be uh, the candidate, and the convention gets into a stalemate. And the party bosses kind of get together and they make a deal. Garfield will run for president. Arthur, a stalwart from New York, will run as a vice president. And so if you remember, New York and Ohio are the two largest electoral states. You know, there you go. Right? And so they win. And in... um, So Garfield is inaugurated in March of 1881. And in April, he's shot by a stalwart. Uh, a deranged one, no doubt. Um, Charles Guito, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name, but he um, shoots Garfield and supposedly yells out, Ha ha! Right? Garfield is dead. Arthur the stalwart is now president. And he becomes one of the first celebrity assassins to try to plead innocent by reason of insanity. This is a somewhat bizarre moment where this, essentially the jury agrees that he's insane and then they hang him. This is ridiculous. But anyway, what happens, however, is Garfield doesn't die right away. He lingers through the spring and summer and dies in September. And what happens is the story of the assassination becomes an obsession. The daily newspaper on the condition of the president, what's going on. But more importantly... Reporters begin to examine this patronage system and the spoil system and this idea of giving people jobs and then shaking them down for money to pay for campaigns. So people essentially buying their jobs, right? And when Garfield finally dies, the American public is outraged and they start to demand that something be done about this system. So a stalwart Arthur is now president of the United States and he's put in this bizarre position where he has to basically support a reform of the spoil system. And it's referred to as the Pendleton Act. And this is in 1883. And the Pendleton Act basically was meant to get rid of patronage and replace it with what we call the civil service. It created the Civil Service Commission to supervise reforms, but it did other things as well. Now, if you wanted to be in the bureaucracy, you had to take a civil service exam. You had to demonstrate through your resume that you actually had competence in the field that you're going to work in. And even more importantly, it was no longer legal to go into government offices and shake down government workers for campaign contributions. And this becomes, you know, a major reform, but it has unintended consequences. Um, when, When both parties realize that they can no longer depend on the patronage to pay for campaigns, they start to turn to corporations and uh, big party contributors uh, for that. And that becomes the norm really until the Nixon administration when uh, big (coughs) campaign reforms uh, go into place in 1974. So the Pendleton Act really changes the environment and it leads to a big campaign in 1884 and this is the election of Grover Cleveland now uh, the Mugwumps were a group of reformers in the Republican Party that were given this name because it's Algonquin 
for big chief or high chief. And so they were seen as kind of like a self-righteous group of people. Cleveland was a reformer, a Democrat, former mayor of Buffalo, New York, and former governor of the state. Um, he had attempted a number of reforms and was very big in two areas, uh, basically getting rid of the spoil system. And the other was to uh, lower the tariff. And I'll kind of touch on that a little bit later. Now, um, Garfield's opponent was James G. Blaine. If you remember, he was the um, party boss senator who promoted James Garfield. And in the wake of Garfield's death, there was a big movement within the Republicans to support a uh, a reformer, you know, a, a member of the half-breeds. So James G. Blaine, uh, honorable senator from the state of Maine, uh, becomes the Republican candidate. And we get scandals. So Grover Cleveland was a bachelor. In fact, he was only the second bachelor in American history to be elected president. And actually, so far, there's only been two, uh, uh, James Buchanan and Grover Cleveland. Now, Cleveland supposedly had a, a, an affair with a woman while he was mayor of Buffalo. And it resulted in, in, a, in an illegitimate child. They did not marry. But Cleveland apparently acknowledged the son, paid child support to the mother, and took care of you know the expenses of raising this child. This story gets out into the media. Cleveland is forced to acknowledge that, in fact, he does have a son. Um, and that probably would have been enough to solidify enough votes to get Blaine into the presidency. But James G. Blaine had two good scandals of his own, one cosmetic and the other substantive. The cosmetic was uh, Blaine showed up for a, a, a rally in New York and the warm-up act, if you will, the guy who kind of gets the, 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 the audience fired up before he spoke uh, was a nativist who gave a ranting anti-immigrant anti-Catholic tirade um, where he tells the audience that a vote for a Democrat is a vote for rum, Romanism, and rebellion. Well, you know, there are a lot of immigrants voting at this time, and, um, and a lot of them are Catholic, and it really uh, did not go over well. And... Um, more substantively, is something called the Milligan Letter. Now, um, Blaine's entire political fortune rested on the fact that he was perceived as a reformer, that he was this honest guy who was out there trying to clean up the system. This letter emerges wherein Blaine is essentially negotiating with a constituent, a supporter, for uh, spots in... The civil service is like, oh, if you give this much, you can get this job. If you give me this much, you could do this. And at the bottom of it, he writes, P.S. Burn this letter. Well, that kind of destroys the image. And now he's James G. James G. Blaine, pathological liar from the state of Maine, to give you the 19th century quip. And um, the mugwumps uh, decided to basically not vote. And they get accused by Republicans of fence straddling because their mugs were on one side and the wumps were on the other. So um, that was the big deal of that time period. So the first thing we will look at when Cleveland takes over is he tries to reform a bunch of things. And in 1887, he's going to sign on to something called the Interstate Commerce, or excuse me, Interstate Commerce Commission. And this is the first time the federal government's going to regulate an industry, and in this case, it's railroads. And I'm going to give you an explanation of how that came about in, in a little later. But um, essentially, Cleveland starts to look at the federal government and sees it as um, essentially a threat to a, a number of growing constituents within within the Democratic Party, namely immigrants and 
working class uh, union laborers. And so he does a proposal to um, lower the tariff. Now, uh, tariff policy is a little odd. It's hard to explain. But essentially, it, we have to, in today's time, we have to realize that in the 1800s, all the way through, um, the tariff was the number one means of revenue for the federal government. So there was no income tax. There there wasn't any kind of like uh, user fees or things of that nature. So the tariff was essentially how they did it. They, they, imposed, they tried imposing excises on different things, different products, but for the most part, it was from the tariff. But in the, in the 19th century, the government started to impose what are called protective tariffs. And these are tariffs where the rates are higher and meant to encourage Americans to buy American products. This is a common thing that's become a big debate today. You know, Donald Trump's uh, tariffs that he's imposed on China, for instance, are from this same school of thought, if, it, if you will. Um, now, um, the problem with that however, is that when America raises its tariffs on, on imports, our domestic manufacturers raise their prices as well because they can and still be competitive. And so what happens is the cost of living just goes up for everyone. And for the poor, it's disproportionately harmful to them. It's a, re it's a regressive taxation form. And so what's happened in this period is the government is taking an incredible amounts of revenue, and I'll go over that again in, in, a, in, a, in a few moments. But basically, the government is swimming in cash, and yet the rates of the tariffs keep going up. And, and Cleveland believed that you, know, you could get rid of the surplus and help the poor by lowering tariffs. And this is going to become a big thing for both the populists and then later the progressives. And it's still part of what's referred to as Wilsonian school. And, and basically, um, this is the position that, Gar that Cleveland takes. Now, this was a red flag to American corporations and to uh, American manufacturers. It was, just, it was just a dead letter issue for them. And so the Republicans used this to raise money and to garner votes in the 1888 election uh, by basically scaring them, saying Gar uh, uh, Cleveland's going to come in, he's going to lower the tariffs, the foreign competition is going to take over your market, and you're, you're dead. And so they raised a lot of money, and they were able to get Benjamin Harrison elected president. Now, Benjamin Harrison is the only grandson of a president to be elected. He was the grandson of uh, Tippecanoe, uh, William Henry Harrison. And he, in fact, uh, Benjamin Harrison was called the Young Tippecanoe. He was from Ohio, a uh, Civil War veteran, and he was basically chosen for his pliability, right? Be Benjamin Harrison essentially believed that his job was to uh, basically do the will of the Congress, to execute the laws of the Congress, right? And um, he does this with a flourish, and it's the beginning of something that we're going to call, or that is called, uh, pork barrel spending. Now, if you kind of follow the imagery, this is from the 19th century as well. Uh, you used to go to the butcher for your meat, and he would cut and trim the pieces that you needed. And then the extra was uh, placed in a what was called a pork barrel at the end of the day to kind of make his workers happy. He would allow them... Uh, by seniority to go into the barrel and pick out their pieces. This is where you get a little line in, in American language. You know, the, the kid that was the youngest had to, quote unquote, scrape the bottom of the barrel. And so um, uh, Harrison doesn't stop the Congress. So if you, if you decide that you're not going to cut the taxes, then you have to do something with the surplus. So uh, and this is hard for us to believe. Can you be imagine the United States government was paying its bills, 
paying down the national debt and had money left over. It's unthinkable, right? So the uh, the mostly the Republicans decided, oh, we got a great idea. Let's spend it on useless things that are simply going to make voters like us. And this started a trend that still exists. Of course, now we do pork barrel spending, but we do it with borrowed money, which is insane. But there, that's for another day. So the Civil War veterans, GAR, go out and they lobby for a piece of this action. And they get it in the Civil War Dependent Pension Act of 1889. And essentially, if you could prove that you were a veteran and that you were injured in battle... And that that injury um, somehow debilitated you to work as much as you would have liked or however you want to put it. Well, that sounds very nice. And so we get that Gilded Age thing, right? On the surface, it seems like a really nice thing for the government to do. And yet, it was riddled with corruption. In fact, the one stat that I remember um, reading is that um, more men received a pension for being injured at Gettysburg than actually fought in Gettysburg. I mean, that's how corrupt it was. But nobody cared. There was lots of money. We're going to dish it out. All these people are going to love us, and they're going to just going to continue to vote for us. And so in 1890, we get the first Congress to spend a billion dollars, and they called them the Billion Dollar Congress. And this pork barreling was pretty significant, but <clears throat> more importantly... They're going to do things that are uh, really detrimental to the long-term economy. And specifically, is uh, something called the Silver Purchase Act. And this was an agreement by the government right, to buy silver at twice its value and to use it as part of the currency. Now, I'm going to explain why that becomes the case. But essentially, what they're going to do is they're going to... Uh, peg the value of silver at 16 ounces to one ounce of gold. This doubled its value, which meant that when the government bought silver, it was going to buy it at twice the rate that it should. Now, this is going to have huge problems later, and I'll talk about that. But this was, you know, there was just all this extra money, and 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 farmers and laborers were complaining that the currency was too restrictive under the gold standard and they wanted silver currency and they and it was inflationary and so uh this was meant to relieve those pressures on the economy now in the farmer community right we already talked about how they were losing laborers because of mechanization but there were multiple pains of agriculture and the, and the one immediate one that was sort of recognizable was the loneliness and the isolation so an american government worker um uh oliver kelly started a group called the grangers and it was meant to be a social organization for people who were in these very rural communities mostly uh, people who were homesteading but it was also in the South and in other parts of rural America. And they had newsletters and they had like um, county fairs that they organized. And it was basically to just create social mechanisms for people to not feel as isolated. And it, it was pretty successful. Um, and the Grangers are going to evolve from a social organization into a lobbying group. Uh, they're going to be joined by another interest group that forms called the Farmers Alliance. And these guys were formed specifically to uh, advocate for new laws. And uh, their, one of their famous leaders, Mary Lease, once told a crowd that they need to raise less corn and more hell. And, and so um, this becomes this, you know, sort of uh, major issue of the time. And... Um, they're going to go after some of the problems that they perceived happening in the farming communities. So when we talk about the different aspects of, of trouble for farmers, it is, it is multifaceted. Obviously, whenever you work in the commodities business, whether you're growing the commodity or selling it, it's, it's a very volatile way to make a living. But there was basically a perfect storm of problems. And for one... Uh, 
farmers were being exposed to new technologies, mechanical reapers, mechanical threshers, the combine, balers, and these were fascinating pieces of equipment. But because they were newer technology, they were incredibly expensive, you know, comparative to the time. And so uh, because of the first the Crimea War and then the Civil War, there was a high global demand for commodities. And so uh, farm prices were relatively high at that time. And uh, so the Homestead Act, which started in 1861, provided very, very low, in fact, free uh, acres of land in the West for people who wanted to take up farming, homesteading, they called it. And so this was um, really initially a really great thing. And once they were done with that five-year period, so about 1865-66, it was theirs, free and clear. And so um, a lot of farmers wanted to take advantage of commodity prices and the new technology by mortgaging their farms and engaging in this new this new stuff, this this new marketplace. And so um, it seems really very reasonable. Now, the reason why it becomes complicated is that Lincoln had started to circulate a currency called the greenback. It was not backed by anything other than the full faith and credit of the federal government. And it was very inflationary. And so farmers negotiated their debts under the greenback. And uh, in, in that kind of an inflationary system, uh, a fixed debt is actually not that big of a deal because you would be earning more money every year. And so uh, it was okay. But what happened is under Grant, the greenbacks were redeemed. They were brought into the treasury and destroyed and replaced by a gold dollar, which was deflationary or constrictive. And so the debt burden for the farmers was significant. And a lot of farmers were going bankrupt and their lands were foreclosed on and um, it, you know banks were taking over their land. So there was resentment of the banks and resentment of the federal currency system. And so that was a problem. The other was the railroads. Now, railroads presented a unique problem because essentially it was a guaranteed monopoly, right? You ha- you had a train service through a rural p- part of America, and it was probably the only train service. If you're a homestead out in the middle of West Jabip, Iowa, right, you have one way of getting your product to market. And so the trains could basically charge you whatever rate for shipping that they wanted, and you were essentially stuck. And now, for some farmers, you would could get away with that by holding back some of your produce, right? Not putting out it all at once when everybody's produce comes out, because then you know prices are too low. So to stabilize their profits, they would hold on to produce. Now, if you were uh, if you were leveraged enough, if you had enough money, you could build your own silos. But a lot of these homesteaders couldn't do that. Uh, it wasn't cost effective. So the railroads built silo facilities by their railroad tracks. So instead of putting your stuff to market right away, you could store the grains at, with the railroad and send them out later. Well, the railroads charged you a rent for that, a storage rate. So farmers began to perceive the railroad as screwing them over twice, right? Whether you used their shipping or their storage, you're still stuck using them. And so they became the target of uh, a lot of the farmer anger, what some people refer to as the agrarian revolt. But um, the Grangers go about becoming a lobbying organization and they petition states to start uh regulating the railroads. And this was not very common at the time. And so this leads to two separate Supreme Court cases. So first they went after the storage rates and the state of Illinois decided that they were going to regulate how much a railroad could charge for storage. The Munn Railroad challenges this and the Supreme Court sided with Illinois. They said, yeah, if a state says that they have a compelling reason to regulate the economy in whatever way, they can do it. It's fine. 
And so that's that was upheld. However, when the state of Illinois decided to regulate shipping rates, the Supreme Court ruled against them, stating that because the train crosses state lines, shipping rates could not fall under state regulation. They were interstate commerce and therefore only the federal government could do that. So if you remember in my previous slide, I talked about the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission. What happened, the Grangers and Farmers Alliance banded together and petitioned Congress for regulating the railroads. And that's how the ICC came into existence. So it was kind of like this progressive thing referred to as the Granger Laws that got passed to regulate railroads. Now, this desire to affect change merges into a third party called the Greenback Labor Party. And hopefully, but now this can start to make sense. They want a return of the Greenback and they wanted laws at the federal level to support labor, labor unions. And so the Greenback Labor Party grew quite significantly. And uh, they were able to get governors elected. They were able to get control of some state legislatures. I believe there was maybe one or two, a handful of congressmen elected. And uh, it proved to be rather successful, except the fact that the government was not going to budge on the greenback. It was it was pretty much accepted by everybody in the government and within the business community that greenbacks were dangerous, right? That that an uncontrolled inflationary spiral could uh, be very bad. So the Greenback Labor Party joined with other groups to form what is called the Populist Party or the People's Party. Now. They're considered one of the most successful third parties in American history, not because they necessarily won uh, a lot of power, but because their platform was filled with items that have pretty much all been accepted in a mainstream political life in America. So, for instance, they wanted an eight-hour workday. They called for a federal department of labor. They called for women's suffrage. They called for a direct vote of senators. They wanted a referendum initiative program implemented. They wanted one-term presidencies. Uh, they, they wanted um, uh, an income tax on the wealthy. And they wanted um, the government to actually own the railroads and to own the telegraph and telephone uh, networks. And th all of these became law on some level, uh, you know, in some degree. All of this became part of the, of, of the American political re uh, regulatory world or, or political reform system. It's going to come about in the progressive era, but still it's, these ideas came from the populist, uh, many of whom will become the, the progressives in there. And th the, the turning point was in 1892. There was a major strike at uh, the um, uh, steel plant in Homestead, Pennsylvania, and this was Andrew Carnegie's steel plant. And um, Pinkerton guards were called in and gunfighting broke out and people were killed. And the National Guard had to be called in to bring order to the place. And this erupted into a, a, a large segment of the population, the working classes, and uh, to, to essentially rise up against the system. And uh, their candidate in 92 was a, a, a General Weaver, a, a Civil War veteran. Um, actually won four states in the Electoral College. And this was actually really detrimental um, for um, uh, um, the system because in 19, 1892, um, the, the, the voting was so spread out that uh, Cleveland was actually able to get voted back into office. So we have this weird experience in American history, the only time when a man won the presidency, lost it, and then won it again. So Grover Cleveland is the only president who has served two non-consecutive terms. And there's kind of like fun stuff about Cleveland. He, um, uh, he actually gets married in his second term. He, he, uh, um, so we have the first uh, presidential wedding. The only other one that happened was when uh, Woodrow Wilson was remarried, he, his second wife. He marries his second wife while he's president of the United States. But um, the only man, the only bachelor to be married in the White House is Grover Cleveland. And then his wife gives birth to a young daughter. 
and it creates hysteria in America, this obsession with the baby girl. And uh, a New York confectionery uh, created a candy bar in her honor, and that's how we have Baby Ruth candy bars. So uh, Cleveland is a, is a rather uh, fun guy to kind of study. Um, now, Cleveland returns to the White House, and um, what happens, of course, is this debate has now become very se severe about what to do with the currency. And as I mentioned earlier, the um, Billion Dollar Congress decided to try to answer that with um, incorporating more silver into the coinage of money. And uh, instead of buying silver at the market rate, which was one ounce of gold equaling 32 ounces of silver, the government agreed to buy 4.2 million ounces a year at a rate of 16 ounces of silver, which doubled the value of silver. Now, it just so happens that 4.2 million ounces was the total amount mined in the United States. So, <clears throat> excuse me, senators from Nevada and Colorado and California promoted this because obviously they were all going to make a windfall of profits. The problem, of course, is it dwindled the national gold supply. And this is going to spell disaster for the government. Again, this is an inflationary activity that's going to come up, that's going to basically blow up in our faces. So what happens in the Democratic Party, we now see a split. People who supported Cleveland's move, or excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, Democrats who supported a populist move towards silver, called silverites, fought against Cleveland and others who embraced something called the gold standard, which made them gold bugs. Now, what happens is we get what's called the Great Panic of 1893. And this is literally a month or two after Cleveland is inaugurated. So he is going to be punished for the free spending Congress that preceded him. And uh, he is going to have four years of depression after this panic. And so... Um, uh, it's called the Great Panic because of the severity of the economic losses that were experienced by the American people. And remember, there's no there's no Social Security payments, there's no un unemployment payments, there's no welfare. This is you know you're on your own, and uh, particularly in many urban areas, this is this is you know massive suffering by the American people. So this nationwide failure and bankruptcies and just closures of companies leads to the significant depression. In fact, it's it's sort of an interesting thing that I'll probably end up saying again later, but in, in um, when the stock market crashed in 1929, uh, members of the media were talking to President Hoover and asked him if he thought that this was another great panic. And he was like, freaks out. He's like, oh no, guys, we don't want to use that word because that's going to make people you know, get, you know, overly excited for no reason. Just, it's more like a Great Depression, you know. Okay, that worked. But anyway, um, this is exactly what happens. And Cleveland is 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 pummeled by it, right? So Cleveland tries to reinforce the, reinforce the currency by repealing the Silver Purchase Act. But this, this angered hit the silver rights. And so there's now a split within his own party. And of course, the populists are out there clamoring for the silver. So the problem, of course, is a depression is not the time to constrict the currency. In fact, in a depression, you want to inflate the currency. So it's a no-win situation in some levels, but it, it worsened the depression instead of making it better. So a, a group of um, activists uh, led by a guy named Coxie marched on Washington to demand the government give them jobs. And it's called Coxie's Army in 1894. And in fact, uh, in in uh, in that march, his wife actually gives birth to a to a baby boy that they call Legal Tender. Right, this is the kid's name, Legal Tender Coxie. Um, which you know, good luck with that one. But anyway, um, uh, it's it's not successful, but it demonstrates that the American people are starting to shift their perception on the government's role in the economy. 
people are now starting to look to the federal government to help, directly help, when economic situations go bad. And so Cleveland has this horrible scenario. He's gone to a gold standard, and the federal treasury is almost out of gold. J.P. Morgan, who controls a huge syndicate of banks, had more con- had control over more gold than the United States Treasury. You think about that for a second, right? One man had more gold than the government of the United States. And so um, Cleveland meets privately with Morgan and negotiates a loan, right? The government gets a loan from an American citizen. J.P. Morgan loans the United States $64 million in gold. And for that, he got a one-day transaction fee of $7.2 million, which, if you guys remember, there's no income tax. So he gets his free and clear, um, which back then is a lot of money. And uh, this com- becomes known, and it, it just freaks people out. I mean, it's just complete anger and vitriol all over the country. It's, it got very bad. So... Um, in 1896, and I, and I should tell you, Cleveland has a number of problems. Uh, he, a, a tumor develops on the top of his uh, um, palate in his mouth, and um, he is fearful that his civil right opponents, which included, I believe, his vice president, were going to start to clamor for him, you know, because cancer back then was seen as kind of like a death sentence. And so Cleveland arranged for one of his friends to have a yacht in New York Harbor becomes one of the most tightly kept political secrets in American history. So for almost a hundred years, people didn't know about it. And um, he arranged to go on board his yacht and they had an oral surgeon inside. The media was told that he was going for a private dinner. Instead, they laid him on the dining room table in this yacht and the oral surgeon removed the tumor without anesthesia. And then cauterized the the wound with a hot iron. Now, I don't know about you, but that is unbelievable, right? And the thing is, he slept for, I believe, like four or five hours. They woke him up and he walked off the yacht on his own fruition because he didn't want to risk if somebody from the media, the press was outside and would record him, you know, stumbling off, right? Uh, and um, we found out in the 1990s, 1990s, all right, 100 years later, uh, descendants of the doctor found a vial with this tumor in it. And it literally on the vial said, President Cleveland's tumor, which is the n- name of my new band, by the way. But um, this this is, is, is really incredible, right? So in 1896, Cleveland still wanted to be the candidate. And the silver rights push him out, right? And instead they go with William Jennings Bryan, who had, uh, who had uh, flirted with the populists. He's from Nebraska. And um, he's this incredible public speaker. And he's going to go out and uh, introduce us to what's referred to as a barnstorming campaign. He's going to travel all over the United States. I mean, hundreds, if not thousands of places that he goes to speak. And he gives what's called the a cross of gold speech. And he, and he laments the failure of the federal government to do good for the, for the common man. And in fact, the gold standard was the big killer. And so he talks about how I, you shall not press upon the bra of labor, this uh, crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. And uh, the Republicans turned to William McKinley, senator from Ohio, uh, pretty popular guy, but a, a, a product of the patronage system, kind of a not a very forceful individual, a party man, if you will. And so um, he is going to launch what many historians believe is the first modern political campaign. He's going to raise $16 million from corporate donors compared to Brian's $1 million, which is a big difference. And McKinley is not even going to travel. Instead, he's going to come out on the front porch of his house. He had this huge wraparound veranda, Victorian home. And he was going to give policy speeches. And uh, his 
campaign manager, uh, Marcus Alonza Hanna, who will is a later becomes a party boss and and uh, a senator from Ohio, uh, organizes the dissemination of these speeches in all the newspapers all over the country, and then spends this money on banners and posters and and different rallies that he does all over the country. And McKinley offers something called bimetallism. He says, you know, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to go back to the gold standard. We're going to stabilize the American currency. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, negotiate with other countries to have gold and silver used in coinage. And that way there'll be a uniformed international currency system. And this is how it would go. He never does it, but this is what he promises in the campaign of 1896. And the free silver election is considered a watershed election because it marked a shift in national politics. No longer were rural and agricultural issues going to dominate the the national agenda. And instead, urban and industrial focus will now be part of that deal. And what we get is really the end of the Gilded Age. And so um, this is a very complicated and dense chapter that's meant to show you how the political scenarios that were going on in the Gilded Age meets this kind of idea of what historians call eras of good feelings. And this was something from the um, Monroe administration, uh, which is back in 1816 to 1828, um, 1824, excuse me. And basically, um, at that time, similar to the Gilded Age, Everything looked really great on the surface, but beneath the surface were problems that weren't being addressed and later on became big issues. Slavery, for instance, uh, tariff policy, those sorts of things. Well, in the Gilded Age, it's the same thing. Issues with the currency, banking, what to do with regulating these new businesses that were evolving out of the industrial period and how to handle urban uh, problems. And it's clear that... um, the government was really either not prepared or not willing to get involved. And this is going to push uh, the population, the people of the United States, to demand more out of their government. And and so this is a, a major turning point in American history. So I hope this was helpful. And uh, this is um, uh, really the time period that sets the stage for modern American politics.